Welcome back everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at a game that I played in the final round of the most recent Title Tuesday event. Now, as many of you know, most of the top players, including myself, were competing in Norway chess, but Jan Pomerci and Ding Loren were missing. So of course, it's very fitting that in Title Tuesday, I would run into Jan Pomerci in the final round. Now, the reason this game is so important is because going to the final round, I was leading the tournament with nine points and Jan was half point back with eight and a half. Nonetheless, Jan is a player who did very, very extensive preparations and he also had the white pieces against me in this game so let's jump right into the action so here we go final round of title tuesday yawn has eight and a half points i have nine points i have the black pieces if i draw this game i win the event so yawn starts by playing e4 i play pawn to e5 and now yawn plays the move pawn to f4 and here i play this move knight c6 now what's interesting about this game is that i was 99 percent sure that yawn was going to play two knight f3 and i was going to respond with knight c6 so when yawn played f4 knight c6 was not my intention i was not expecting him to play the king's gambit but Fortunately, with an opening like the King's Gambit, there's so many different variations that are playable. As Magnus Carlsen himself mentioned, when I played against him in the Armageddon game in Norway chess, as such, it's still a decent move. So here, Jan plays knight to f3. And now I play this very enterprising move, pawn to f5. Those of you guys who have watched a couple of my past King's Gambit videos will note that I have this exact position against none other than the famous Ukrainian Grandmaster, Vasily Ivanchik, in Cap the Ag in 2008. So after f5, we get this move, pawn takes f5, and now I play this move e4. Jan plays knight to e5, and now I go knight to f6. Now it's worth noting here that if I were to play a move like d6, attacking the knight on e5, after this very nasty move, queen to h5, the game is already effectively over. If I play king to e7, uh-oh, spaghettio, queen f7 is checkmate. If I go pawn to g6 after pawn takes pawn, let's just say I take the knight. White goes g7, checking the king. And after I've moved my king, white takes the rook in the corner, gets a second queen, and wins the game on the spot. So I have to play knight f6 to stop queen h5. And now Jan plays this move d4. Here I go d6. And now he shocks me and everybody else who's watching title Tuesday with this great move bishop to b5. Now it's worth noting if you guys are looking for some king's gambit courses. I was told that apparently Jan did a course for chessable on the king's gambit. And this line was mentioned in it. Now this of course I don't know from direct experience. But when I spoke to Ari and Tari about this game on the red state. As we were on a nice little boat headed toward the famous Norwegian island of Fjorda Fjarda. I know I mispronounced that, of course, for all the Norwegians. I apologize. But Arian did mention that this line was in that course. Now, I, of course, was unaware of that as I was playing this game. So I was completely taken aback by bishop b5. What I was expecting Jan to do is trade the horses on c6. And after a move like knight to c3, I can simply take the pawn. Let's just say white goes bishop e3. And after d5, I have the classic big black center as well as the connect three. I can develop the bishop, castle the king. And already here, black is doing completely fine here due to this protected pass pawn. Great bishop scope, open file for the rook. And just in general, black is for choice. So, when Jan goes bishop b5, especially in a blitz game where you don't have a lot of time to think, I'm already feeling very uneasy about the situation. Nonetheless, after a bit of a think, I do take the knight, because I simply don't know what else to do. If I play a move like bishop takes f5 after knight takes knight, <coughs> pawn takes knight, and bishop takes pawn, now my king and rook are under attack when I block with the bishop after bishop takes rook, queen takes rook, and castles. White simply has an extra rook for a bishop, and it should be simply winning for a player of Jan's caliber. So, I decide to take the knight on e5. Jan captures back with the f-pawn, of course. And now I play bishop to d7 here, breaking the pin of the knight. Now, I would love to move the knight to, say, d5. But here, once again, after the very nasty queen to h5 check, if I go king to e7, for example, now there's bishop g5. Absolute disaster here. If I play g6, pawn takes pawn. If I take the pawn, I lose the rook again. If I move the king to, say, d7, white can now go queen to f5 check. King can go to either e7 or e8. It doesn't matter. But queen to f7 will be checkmate either way. So I'd love to move the knight, but I can't. And again, in a blitz game, you just have to look for a very simplistic idea. The other option I have here is bishop takes pawn. But after pawn takes knight and queen takes and castles, I wasn't really sure what is going on here. Now, if I have a couple of minutes to think here, I probably can work out the fact that after a move like bishop to d6, g4 does not work simply because I have queen h4 threatening checkmate and also breaking the pin. So, if I have time, I can think about this without having time. I have to worry about g4. I also have to worry about d5. Now, again, 
After d5 castles, if white takes the horse, there's bishop c5 check, creating the classic fossil, and black is winning. But with not a lot of time having spent over a minute up to this point already here, I decided to make a practical decision and just go bishop to d7 instead, because after pawn takes knight, queen takes pawn, I know I'm going to be able to castle my king out of the center of the board. Pawns in f5 and d4 can potentially become weak, and most importantly, I can also go bishop d6 with ideas like queen to h4 down the road. So now my moves become a little bit more straightforward, and a blitz in particular, this is a very, very important point, that even if the position may be slightly worse, if you have a lot of very quick moves that you can play, it's much easier to get back some time, your opponents to think, and you start feeling the rhythm of the game once again. So after queen takes f6, Jan decides to castle. I castle here, and now he plays this move, bishop to e3, defending the pawn on d4. Now, Jan could have tried to play a move like c3, guarding the pawn as well. I suspect that the reason he didn't do this is because after bishop to d6 here, you'll notice that in this position, white, white can't really get the bishop into the knight, bishop of the knight into the game very easily. If you go bishop e3, now I have queen to h4, threatening the mate on h2. And if white goes g3, I sack the bishop. And after pawn takes bishop, queen takes pawn. Now, of course, it's check. I will collect the bishop on e3 here with check as well. And it's simply gg, why not? So Yah decides to go bishop e3, figuring now he guards the pawn on d4. He can develop the knight on the next move. And unless I can put immediate pressure on this pawn on d4 with the knight in the game and then c3 next move, white will have completed the development and have a big advantage. So I go bishop to d6, creating the same threat of queen to h4, and now Jan takes the knight on c6. Now, this is a move that I think Jan played more based on the time situation and intuition than anything else. Again, if Jan has a lot of time to think here, I think he would probably go g3, followed by knight c3 or knight d2, and white still keeps a bit of an advantage. Nonetheless, he trades the bishop for the knight on c6, and now I have d's bishops here on d6 and c6, and Jan plays queen to g4 as a preventative way of stopping queen to h4. Additionally, white has ideas like bishop g5 to hit the queen and then the rook and collect some material. So after queen g4, I play h5, and now Jan goes queen to h3, and I think this is sort of the start of going in the wrong direction. Now, Jan was feeling very confident here. He was actually live streaming this at the same time, and he has this big 30-second advantage. He knows I'm out of prep. He's got an extra pawn, and I think this is where he probably should have played queen to g5. And after bishop e7, trade, trade, and a move like c3, black is still okay after bishop b5, rook f2, and c5, but black should never really be able to be better here and white should have no major issues nonetheless Jan decides to go queen to h3 and i think this is when things start to go the wrong way because now i play bishop d7 now the reasoning behind bishop d7 is very simple the queen is on this diagonal here and this pawn is kind of annoying on f5 so for example if i can ever play rook f8 and capture this pawn i'm suddenly winning because the queen simply has no squares to go to additionally if i get g6 this is another way to try and collect the pawn on f5 and if i ever win this pawn on f5 with these bishops black is just much much better so in this position here, after queen to h3 and bishop d7, Jan plays this move knight to c3, attacking the pawn on e4, and now I go rook d e8, guarding the pawn, and again, I have a very simple plan. I just want to play g6. That's all I want to do here. I know that I'm going to get g6. Bishop takes f5. If I get those two moves after they're played, I'll gain some time, and then I'll be able to think. And for my opponent here, Jan, who has started this game up a minute out of the opening, the time advantage is starting to dwindle a little bit. So Jan goes knight to d5. I play queen to f7. He plays c4, trying to use the pawns in the center, create some pressure because this bishop on d6 is absolutely perfectly placed, and it is the patented classic wooden shield. So here we get pawn to g6, which is what I play, and now Jan plays bishop f4. Now, you'd love to take the pawn on g6 here, but after pawn takes pawn, I can sack the queen for the rook, and after rook takes queen, bishop takes queen, pawn takes bishop, I can go rook h g8, attacking the pawn on g6. If knight f6, I take with check. If rook f6, now I can go rook e to f8 here, and white can't really keep this pawn on g6. If you trade the rooks, I take back with the bishop. Pawn is still under attack, and after knight to f4 and bishop h6, it's simply winning here because I'm going to trade the bishop for the knight, win the pawn on g6, and the rook is much better than this bishop on f4. I can swing side to side, go to the end of the board. At any rate, it's a much more active piece, and white also, his extra pawn is a double pawn on h3, so white really doesn't have any great counterplay. So, Jan plays bishop to f4, I trade the bishops, and now I take, and here he plays this move queen to e3, which is a mistake. Now what Jan should have played here was this nasty move, knight takes g6, and if Jan had found knight g6, there's a very, very good chance he would have won this game, because now I have a big problem. I can't take with the bishop due to the pin, 
if I take with the queen after the queen trade, white is simply up a pawn here. White has six pawns to my five pawns, but more importantly, is a two on one on the king side. He has four on three on the queen side, and my pawn at e4 is potentially a big weakness here. So white should be doing very, very well. So instead, Jan plays queen e3, which I think is just a blunder, trying to play fast, keep the flow of the game. But this now hangs the pawn on c4. And just like that, now suddenly I'm up a pawn here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. White is one, two, three, four, five. And now white has to be very careful to not end up much worse. So Jan goes rook a c1. I play queen f7. I do not go hunting for all the pawns because if I take on a2 after rook a1, queen b2, and rook fb1, queen c2, and say rook a7, suddenly the rooks are super, actually not rook, rook a7, sorry, rook c1 first, and then rook to a7. White has these very, very active rooks on the 7th. There's rook a8, knight d5. White's counterplay is overwhelming, and his king on g1 is very safe here with the two pawns. My king is not safe at all. And so a pawn is only a pawn at the end of the day, and you can't just go hunting for them if you're going to lose your king. So I decided to play queen f7 back, guarding the pawn on c7, guarding the pawn on g6, keeping an eye towards the pawn on a2 still. So now Jan plays rook to c5, and here I go Here I go b6. I could have played king to b8. Actually, I was about to say that's what I was going to play, but I realized after king b8, white can again sack the knight on g6, and after takes and rook f5, now material is only even, so it's not the end of the world, but black really should not be much better here. So when I play b6, Rook has to move. You can no longer go for this trick with knight g6. And he plays rook c3. I go king to b7. He plays rook fc1, stacking the two towers on the c file here. And now I play rook to e7. And Jan plays his move queen e2. Now in this position, if I had a lot of time to think, I suspect I would have found this move bishop g4, attacking the queen in the knight. And after queen to e3 and rook f8, with my own double stack on the f file, black is much better here. At any rate, I didn't see it. I was trying to move fast. fast. As you guys can tell from the time situation, I am down 40 seconds here. I'm down 40 seconds, so I still have to move fairly quickly because even though I'm getting a very, very brief, even though I'm getting this, this bit of an increment, it's not enough if I'm down to five seconds or less at the end of the game. I will just lose. So I play Rook to D8. Jan goes Rook to A3. And now I start to play the meta game by playing Pawn to A5. Now, again, here it's very unpleasant. I have 34 seconds. He has a minute 13. I don't want to spend too much time. At the same time, if I play king to b8 and white goes queen to a6, c6, if I don't have the time to calculate this line after rook takes c6, it feels like I'm just going to lose. For example, say I play rook takes d4, there's rook takes b6. After takes, queen takes b6, he can take the rook and probably white is winning due to the weaknesses. My king is very open here. I don't have a lot of protection around it. Additionally, I don't even know if this line is working or not. Now, computer says it's winning, but with only seconds to process whether this is okay or not, I can't do pure calculations, and I could just be completely lost. So, I decide to play a5 for practical reasons here, because I know that Jan in the situation, if he draws the game, he is not going to win the tournament. And I, Jan knows this. He has a half point less than me at this point in the game, and so as such, he plays this move b4. The reason is that after rook takes a5 and b takes a5, white sacks the rook, but it's not more than simply a draw here. After queen to b5, king c8 check. If I go king d7, white has queen c6, king a8, queen a8, and the classic yo-yo with the draw. Additionally, if I go king b8 and white plays rook c5, trying to lift the rook, this also doesn't work because I can play rook to d6. And after rook to b5, rook to b6, white trades the rooks, but black simply has one extra rook on e7. And it's too much of a material disadvantage. So black will win the game. So when I go a5, I'm playing the meta. I know that Jan can't take. But for Jan, it's difficult too. Because he has to just play a move. Which is why he goes b4. Now after b4, I play queen to f6. Attacking the pawn on d4. Jan takes the pawn on a5. And at this point, he has to go all in. If he tries to play a move like rook to d1, for example. I can simply go bishop g4. Winning either the queen on e2 or the rook on d1. If white tries to play queen e3, I will just trade the queens. And after b takes a5 and e3, I start pushing p in the center of the board, and I will win this as well. So here Jan takes on a5. I play queen takes d4, and now he goes king to h1. And here I play bishop g4. Now, I'd love to play a move like e3, but after a takes b6, suddenly the queen and rook are coordinating very nicely on the a file. The rook on c1 is perfectly placed, and now white is in great shape. So I play bishop g4, trying to kick the queen off of this diagonal. Jan goes queen f1. He'd love to go queen b5 and maybe try to create a lolly with some kind of a6, queen c6. But it doesn't work because I can go for the ice skater with queen to d1 check, sacking the queen. If white takes my queen after rook takes rook, queen f1 is the only move. And then rook takes f1 is simply checkmate. 
Additionally, if white goes if white goes queen to f1 back, at the very least, I can trade the queens and play e3, e2 once again, and this will simply be winning as well. So Jan goes queen to f1. Now I go e3 here because I know that after a takes b6, e2, white is in a lot of trouble. After a takes b6, e2, if white tries to go rook a7 check, I can simply take the pawn. The rook and the queen are both under attack. If white goes queen to e1 here, there are many ways to win, but probably simply taking the rook. Queen to a5 check. King b7, rook guards the pawn on c7 here. And after rook to b1, I can simply go queen b6, sacking the queen. And after white takes, there's no queen d5 because the rook covers the square. And when you go queen to e1, once again, rook d1 will simply be gg. Why not? So here Jan plays queen to e1, and now I play this play the move pawn takes pawn now queen to d1 might also still be winning but when i take the pawn on b6 i just dodge anything weird except after queen d1 rook a7 king b6 this is winning because the queen is pinned you cannot move it from the e1 square but on the other hand when i take the pawn white simply has no threats here there's no way to get a queen to the a file here the pawn covers the square the king covers a7 and a6 and my next move is just going to be queen d1 or queen takes f4 also worth noting this is why queen takes f4 is not not a good move so after rook to a7 check if i take here there is queen to a5 mate because there's no queen on the back rank which prevents the queen from moving so i take the pawn on b6 Jan here decides to play h3 trying to keep the game going i take the knight on f4 and now he plays this move rook a c3 white would love to capture the bishop but after i sack the queen for the rook with queen takes rook on c1 queen takes queen and rook to d1 check creating the classic kebab it's simply game over so Jan goes rook a3, c3, but now I sack the queen anyway because who needs a queen in their life? And I play queen takes rook, Jan takes back, I play rook to d1 here, and now the game is effectively over because I've sacrificed my queen, but now I'm going to get a new queen. So Jan takes the bishop on g4 just as a last-ditch effort, hoping that I'll take the queen on e1, but no, no, no. I decide that I'm simply going to trade the rooks on c1, and now Jan has no choice but to take the rook. I make a new queen with e1, I promote, and here Jan resigns the game. So, with its victory, I do end up winning title Tuesday. I score 10 points out of 11. I win 10 games in a row after losing in the very first game. I win, I think, my 54th title Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Some statisticians can go check the numbers to be precise. But I do win this very, very nice game in the King's Gambit opening. Once again, as we're seeing from all the games that I've played with the white pieces, now the games that I'm playing with the black pieces, King's Gambit, while we all love the opening, it's a, it gives us all these great romantic notions of a, a world in which chess computers didn't exist in the 1850s through the 1900s, it's probably just not the best opening because even here, I got a slightly worse position, but, the, but it was very playable, and I was able to turn the tables once Jan was out of his prep and win a very, very nice game. So at any rate, you guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't. We're going to be reaching a very big milestone probably today, in fact, when we do cross a 2 million subscriber mark. So I'd really like to say thank you to everybody for all the love and support over the last couple of years. It's been an amazing ride. I've had a great time, and this would not be possible without all of you guys. So thank you so much once again. I would also add that I'll be back to the live stream doing everything pretty soon. If you guys are disappointed by the quality, I do apologize, but I am actually doing this recording here from Montreal in Canada. Um, as I was here for a chess event yesterday, the Transcontinental Tournament, we made some announcements, some big stuff going on in the near future, so I'm really looking forward to who, what's going on. But at any rate, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, so make sure to hit that subscribe button below, and we'll be back very, very soon with some more great YouTube-only content. See you guys. Have a good one. Bye.